and the right side seeing the other, because, <laughs> well, it's nice that we can all sit together again, kind of. Good morning and welcome to worship. Thank you for joining me here in the sanctuary or watching on the live stream. Glad to have you all with us. Today is the second Sunday after Pentecost. Today's question is, Christ conquers Satan, whose side are you on? I haven't determined which side is the correct side yet. Today in our worship, we'll see in the readings Satan's power over weak sinners like us and Christ's victory over Satan, which becomes our victory through faith. We'll open our worship with the opening hymn, which is number 343, Christ is the World's Light. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. O Lord, our Lord, how glorious is your name in all the earth. Almighty God, merciful Father, you crown our life with your love. You take away our sin, you comfort our spirit, you make us pure and holy in your sight. You did not spare your only Son, but gave him up for us all. O Lord, our Lord, how glorious is your name in all the earth. O Son of God, eternal Word of the Father, you came to live with us. You made your Father known. You washed us from our sins in your own blood. You are the King of glory. You are the Lord. O oh Lord, our Lord, how glorious is your name in all the earth. We pray. O oh God, you rule over all things in wisdom and kindness. Take away everything that may be harmful and give us whatever is good. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading this morning is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 3. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. This is the word of the Lord. 
The psalm of the day is Psalm 130. We'll sing it together. The second reading this morning is taken from John's Revelation, chapter 20. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Alleluia. Please stand. Alleluia. 
gospel for this, the second Sunday after Pentecost, is taken from the gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 3. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law, who came down from Jerusalem, said, He is possessed by Beelzebul. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided... He cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying, He has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside, looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister, and mother. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. And we'll continue by singing hymn number 396, In Adam We Have All Been One.
the year is 90 A.D. You are a Christian living in the Roman Empire. The emperor's name is Domitian. If you've been around long enough, you remember the persecutions that happened to the Christians under Emperor Nero, how many were taken away and died because they were beheaded or thrown to the lions. Even most of the apostles have already been killed. Only one remains, John, and he's exiled to the island of Patmos. You don't know if this persecution is being carried out by the emperor, Domitian, or by somebody else. All you know is somebody is coming for the Christians. You see how many empty seats there are in the home where your church meets. It would be so much easier, right? To just go back to those old Roman gods you used to follow. Christianity has now been around 60 years, a full life, right? Maybe it's time to push it, put it out the pasture. Go back to the Roman gods. Save your neck, literally, from being removed. And then this letter comes. A letter from Patmos. A letter from the Apostle John. One Sunday, the church elder reads this new letter, and right away you notice it's quite different than John's other letters. His other three letters are straightforward. He says what he means and means what he says. But this one is quite different. It's a vision. A vision of many different things. And you hear about seven golden lampstands, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven plagues. You hear about Armageddon, Gog and Magog, a beast from the earth and a beast from the sea, People dressed in white robes, a lamb. And as you're listening, you begin to understand that because this is a vision, it's a little different than other letters that you've received, either from John or from Paul. They speak straightforwardly, maybe use an illustration every once in a while, but this is almost all illustration of what's happening. For example, in what Christians in 2021 will call chapter 12, you see here about this vision of a pregnant woman and a dragon. A dragon that is called Satan, that ancient serpent who leads the whole world astray. And the dragon is waiting, lying in ambush by this pregnant woman, waiting for her to give birth, ready to devour her child. Her child, who is called the one who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. If this dragon is Satan, the child, who else could he be but Jesus? And as you're listening, you remember how Satan stirred up Herod to murder all the toddlers in Bethlehem just so that he could get Jesus. You remember how Satan himself came to Jesus in the wilderness to tempt him. You remember how Satan t stirred up Judas to betray Jesus. You remember how 60 years before, more or less, Jesus ascended back into heaven just as this child was snatched up to God and to his throne. And if you haven't already, you realize that this letter is a sort of retelling. A retelling of past events, present circumstances, and future promises. But it's more than a retelling. It's a revealing. You might call it a revelation. God is pulling back the curtain for John and for us to see what's going on behind the scenes. And as you listen, you realize it's actually much worse than you thought. It's not the emperor or some other earthly power that wants to remove your head from your body. It's the devil himself. And his minions, Paul, was so right when he wrote, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And now the church elder is nearing the end of this 
letter. It's the final countdown. He reads John's words. I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. Good thing you were paying attention at the beginning of this letter when John recorded Jesus' words in this vision. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. This angel with the key and the chain, this isn't any old angel. This is the angel of the Lord, Jesus himself. Jesus comes down with the key to hell and a chain in his hand. He seizes the dragon and binds him, seals him up so that he cannot deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years are ended. And by now you've realized that these pictures in this vision represent something else. You know that hell doesn't have a literal gate with a lock on it, that there's no chain that could physically bind Satan. <clears throat> He's a spirit. He would slip out, slip through out of the chain, slip through the gate. But you understand from the vision that Satan is in some way restrained. Perhaps you're even thinking, because you know the gospel so well, to a time when Jesus himself was accused of casting out demons by the prince of demons, by the power of Beelzebul. And to paraphrase Jesus a little, he says, that doesn't make a lot of sense. <clears throat> Why would Satan cast out Satan? Why would Satan cast out his demons? If Satan is divided against himself, he can't stand. And then he adds a parable. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. When Jesus cast out demons, he tied up Satan with his word and took them from the devil's possession to be his own. And so you realize that the chain in Jesus' hand is his word. It's the gospel. Whenever the gospel is preached, the devil's chain is shortened. The good news of forgiveness through Jesus frees a person from the power of the devil. And you think about what the church elder just read. To keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. Knowing your history, you remember that it wasn't until Jesus died, rose, and ascended that the nations began to pour into God's church. Before that, it was really only one nation that followed God. Israel. Sure, there were converts here and there, but now, after Jesus' ascension, there were people who believed in Christ in Samaria and Asia Minor, in Greece and in Rome. In 90 AD, you wouldn't know this, but there would someday be believers in Asia, Africa, Europe, and even in this place called the New World, the Americas. And we see the New Testament church growing during the period of a thousand years, not a literal thousand years, but a time of full completeness from the end of Jesus' ministry on earth until he comes again. <clears throat> and yet John's letter continues, saying about the devil, he must be set free for a short time. If he is chained for that complete period of time, however long God has determined, by the preaching of the gospel, then there will be a time when he is freed, a time when the preaching of the gospel diminishes. And you remember the Lord's words. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. 
And as you're sitting there with your church family, you look around and you notice the faces that aren't there anymore. Some of them have been carried off and killed. Others have seen that and decided that it's not really worth it. What about you? Will you be the next one killed? Or will you be the next one to lose heart? And that's where John's vision takes a turn. The scene changes. He says, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Two groups, first those with authority to judge, and then the souls of those who have been beheaded on account of the gospel of Christ. Those who did stand firm to the end, who did not submit to the devil or to any earthly power that would forbid them from faith. Those who were dead on earth were still alive with Christ and reigning with him. Though you no longer see them, John saw them. If Christ's reign is eternal, then why this mention of the thousand years, right? Think about that verse. Think about that sentence. If you've got it in front of you, take another look at it. Who does it say lives and reigns for a thousand years? The souls of those beheaded. They are the ones mentioned as living and reigning with Christ for a thousand years. Like with Satan's binding, again, a complete period of time as God has determined it. But the length of Christ's reign is not mentioned. Though it is forever and ever. The church elder continues reading. The rest of the dead did not live until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. Perhaps John is talking about the fact that when a person's body dies, their soul goes up to heaven and they continue to live. But these words sound very similar to something Paul wrote, what he wrote to the Ephesians. He said, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. Unlike the second resurrection, which is the bodily resurrection from the dead, the first resurrection is a spiritual resurrection. It happens for all who believe, as Paul said in Ephesians, you were dead in your transgressions. But God, who is rich in mercy, made you alive. He resurrected you with Christ because of his grace and mercy. The second death has no power over those who share, like us, in the first resurrection. These words from John's vision sound very similar to Jesus' words in John's gospel. I am the resurrection and the life the one who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. The souls of believers who have died in their bodies, those souls don't die. They still live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. While we, who are still on earth, wait for him to return in his glory. Instead of death, they live. The church elder reading John's vision continues, They will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Again, not that literal thousand years, but that complete period of time God has determined. You remember what the elder, an elder in John's vision said earlier in what would be called chapter 7. 
These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. You remember what Peter said about God's people now. You are a chosen people. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is why God gave John this vision. John said at the beginning of this, his letter, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. This vision was written down for you who worry about the devil's influence on this world and his attacks on your heart. This vision was written down for you who worry about losing everything, even your own head, on account of Christ. This vision was written down for you who wonder whether it's even really worth the struggle. John's vision shows you that Jesus has chained the devil with the preaching of the gospel. When the devil comes near, preach the gospel at him. Tell him, you have no hold. I have been forgiven by Christ. I am God's child. I am going to heaven. He will flee, just as James says. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Continue preaching the gospel of forgiveness that yanks the devil back by the throat. Christ preaching powerfully pens in the devil. John's vision shows you what awaits. Even those who were beheaded back in John's time are now living and reigning with Christ. Who do you think John may have seen in that crowd? Just nameless Christians? Perhaps but perhaps he saw some of his fellow apostles who had already been killed. Peter. Paul. Perhaps even his very own brother, who was the first of the apostles to be killed, and he was beheaded. James. What are you going to take from this sermon today? Revelation, this vision, gives us a lot to chew on, a lot to sort through. Chapter 20 is one of the hardest, and it's one of the ones that's often misused. It's so easy to get caught up in the symbolism, in the figurative language, and kind of get lost. We want to read the Bible literally, because it's God's word, to understand what he has to say to us, but that also means reading it literarily. What I mean is this, reading it as it presents itself. Parts of it are history. We read the history as history. Parts of it are poetry. We read the poetry as poetry, right? Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd. God is not a little, literal shepherd with a, an actual shepherd's crook who actually takes care of literal sheep. We understand poetry uses figurative language. And the same is true for visions. We understand that visions also use figurative language. For example, just two weeks ago we studied the vision of the Valley of the Dry Bones, and towards the end of that reading, God said, these bones are the people of Israel. Whether or not those bones actually existed don't really matter. But the people, still alive, were crying out to God, our bones are dried out! 
We have no hope. It's gone. And we see God's promise in bringing those bones back to life that he will bring his people back to spiritual life, bring them back to their land. The same is true of how we read John's revelation. It is a vision. God intends for us to read it as it presents itself with all of the pictures and illustrations and figurative language it uses. Things like the number 1,000 aren't meaningless. It just doesn't mean a literal 1,000 years. In the Bible, 10 is often the number of completeness. We have 10 times 3, so a full number of of completeness, the full number of years. And we see what happens during this thousand years. The devil is chained by the preaching of the gospel. The nations begin to pour in and come to faith. This is the time between Jesus' ascension, his resurrection, and his coming again. We, we are living in the thousand years now, even though it's been 2,000 years since Jesus ascended. The thousand years will come to an end when Jesus comes again. So here are some things you can take away from Revelation 20, and when you read it later this week, you can be reminded of it. First, the question that our service theme asks today, Christ conquers Satan, whose side are you on? You have heard the gospel preached. When the gospel is preached, Satan is tied up. And the Holy Spirit once more takes you as possession for Christ. If you're worried about what side you're on, the solution isn't, well, I just need to start acting better, behaving better, living more like God wants me to. The solution is to hear the gospel. Because it's through the gospel that the Holy Spirit puts you on Christ's side by forgiving your sins and promising you life. If you're confident that you're on Christ's side because you have lived a good life, because no one could say anything bad about you, be careful. It's not the law. It's not God's commands that put you on Christ's side. It's the gospel. The promise of free and full forgiveness through Christ. The second truth you can take away today is that it is the gospel that chains the devil. Remember what Paul said in Ephesians. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. As we look around us in the world and see the devil's influence, our attempts to chain him are often a little bit different than just preaching the gospel. You've got to create the right laws, elect the right politicians, argue and debate with others until you finally convince them, and so on and so forth. And all of these, so so many times, are so far from the gospel of forgiveness and just our only law, law, law. God says do this. Repent of your lack of trust in the power of the gospel, which is the salvation for all who believe. Trust in the forgiveness that gospel gives to you, which is the same power of forgiveness that goes out to change the hearts of others. And third, the truth that our earthly story really has very little to do with our, the heavenly glory we will receive. Think about how those souls John saw died. They were beheaded. Their heads were not cut off. One of the most shameful deaths you can think of. Completely helpless. Completely powerless. They couldn't stop those people from cutting off their heads. And yet John sees their souls in glory, living and reigning with Christ. Whether your life is full of happiness or sadness, success or shame, blessings or curses, that really doesn't change your heavenly glory that's promised to you. The reward we receive in heaven comes through Christ. And so the reward that we receive in heaven is Christ's 
reward, which the Father gives to us through faith. And so now all that is left is to wait. And as we wait, to live in the confidence that Christ preaching powerfully pens in the devil, that Christ preaching powerfully places priests on thrones. We live out that confidence by preaching the gospel to hurting souls, whether they are within or outside the family of believers, so that the devil is yanked back by his neck. We live out that confidence by serving as God's priests before God and our neighbor. And we wait. We wait until the thousand years are over, whenever that may come. And Christ brings us to live in his heavenly kingdom where we will live for, with him not just a thousand years, but forever. Amen. Please stand. And now, may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. We now join together to confess our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Christian, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. The offering plates are at the back of church if you'd like to leave an offering there on your way out this morning. There are also connection cards in the chairs near you if you'd fill those out and let us know that you joined us here today. You can also go online to atonement.org slash connection dash card. This morning, during our co communion service, uh, we will be returning more or less to the way we were doing things. If you saw the announcement, you know that uh, we, we uh, put that out there this week, uh, especially for the people in the center. On the sides, we give you the option to continue to come up at just by yourself. Uh, the ushers are going to pass through now and ask you if that's what you want to do. If you do not want to come up by yourself, that's, a, that's not a clear way to put it. If you want to come up by yourself, do a thumbs down. If you want to come up with the table, do a thumbs up. Okay, so if you're coming up with everybody, thumbs up. If you're coming up by yourself, thumbs down.
Please stand for prayer. This morning in our prayers, we'll continue to pray for Aaron Johnson's Aunt Penny, for Leah Bergdorf's friend Julie, for Sandy Shrout, and for Brian Crawford. We'll also continue to pray for Victoria Veretti. She's the little girl we, I mentioned last week, uh, just 29 weeks old over in the NICU over at uh, Plano Medical City. We'll also say a prayer for Hayden Reyes, who was in the hospital this past weekend. Uh, she had a high fever and had a, had a seizure as well. She's doing much better now, but uh, pray that God would continue to keep her in his care. And finally, we'll say a prayer for Bill Blue's friend, Tom, who we've been praying for for a few months now. He had surgery last week, a very successful surgery, and his prognosis looks very good. I believe you said, Bill, that his cancer, there's no more cancer right now. So very good, very good prognosis. So we'll pray. Dear Lord, this morning we ask that you would look on those who are ill or sick or suffering. We ask that you would be with Penny, Julie, Sandy, Brian, Victoria, and Hayden. Lord, be with them and grant them healing according to your will. Protect and preserve them, O Lord. Be with those who take care of them. Grant them wisdom and knowledge to be able to best serve them. Most of all, Lord, send them peace through your Holy Spirit and peace to those who love them knowing that you have forgiven their sins and ours and promised us life eternal in heaven forever. Lord, this morning we also give you thanks for granting Tom a successful surgery to remove his cancer. We ask now that you would help him to recover and that you would prevent him from getting cancer again. Most of all, Lord, be with him as well, with your Holy Spirit, to give him peace, both to him and to his loved ones. Open our eyes, O Lord to see the spiritual dangers facing those who do not yet trust you as Savior, as Lord. Move us to share with them the hope of, etern of unending life, which we have in you. Go with us into our world. Support us in all we do to your glory. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We now continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. By the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, he empowered his church to be witnesses of Christ to the ends of the earth. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is of your glory. You are my God and I will exalt you. I will give you thanks for you have become my salvation. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, 
gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. O Christ, Lamb of God. You may be seated. The table of the Lord is now prepared. In this sacrament, Christ promises that he is truly present in his body and blood to grant us the forgiveness of sins. Come, for all things are now ready at the direction of the usher. Stephen, do we have any individual coming up? Okay.
raised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. And we close our worship this morning with the final hymn, number 321. Savior again to thy dear name we raise.
Once again, good morning. And thank you for joining me here at Atonement Lutheran Church, whether you were here in the sanctuary or watching on the live stream. Glad to have you all with us today. A few announcements. Directory pictures, please still, if you haven't yet, submit a family or household photo for our church directory. This will help us get to know each other better. I know what your faces look like. I am often surprised when someone says to me, who's that? What do they look like? I know it's part of the divide between first and second service, but it's not even just that. So let's make it easier for each other, make it easier for ourselves to get to know each other by having a picture directory. All we're asking for, nothing professional, doesn't have to be. You could send a professional picture if you want, but just a casual photo showing individuals from the shoulders up, leave space around the photo so it can be trimmed into a square, and then send it to secretary at atonement.org by June 13th. That's next Sunday. Next Saturday, summer kickoff grill out. Please join us for our backyard grill out next Saturday from 12 to 4 p.m. Come and enjoy good food, friendly conversation, fun games, and activities for adults and children. And I'm glad it says for adults because on the next page it says we'll have an obstacle course bounce house. And I was told that there is no weight limit. We'll have to, I guess, confirm that. But I was told no weight limit. So if the whole congregation is invited. Everyone here, you're invited. If, you're gonna, if you want to come, it's free. Just RSVP by June 10th to Ruby Zajac at secretary.atonement.org. You have our COVID update here. The announcement that went out this past week discussing our changes, you've noticed a lot of them. For example, no more seating restrictions. And that means now everyone can sit on the right side of the sanctuary just like they've always wanted. <laughs> also, so relaxed capacity, relaxed mask. Definitely, well, already two weeks ago, people weren't really wearing masks anymore. So I think if you, if you look at the numbers, our numbers are not going up or down. I don't even know if they're keeping track anymore, but things have definitely tailed off. So we are in a good place. Communion has changed how it's practiced. I noticed in both services now no one wanted to come up individually anymore, so perhaps even by next week. If not by next week, probably by July we'll get rid of this way of doing it and just go back to the tables. And the coffee bar returned. There might still be some coffee left over if you want some to stick around and talk a little while. And uh, finally, last two things. Summer camps at Camp Shallow, still in here, still can go. That starts, though, next Sunday so for, for teen camp. So if you want your teenage person to go to that, you better sign up now. Coffee Bar is back. That's it. Have a blessed week in the Lord.